If you want to congregate, vaccinate. We got this SVG. If you want to eliminate the spread of the virus in our place and do not procrastinate. But rather let us vaccinate. Hello everyone, I am Shaquille Bob. I am a former Miss Pitani, a former Miss Rural SDG and Miss LCD contestant and runner-up. I'm a lawyer by profession but a pageant lover at heart. Do not let the negatives prey on your mind because a stitch in time saves nine. So, it's COVID vaccination time. Get vaccinated today to reduce the impact of COVID-19 in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I urge you, get vaccinated. It is safe and it is effective. Stop the spread, help the fight, and make the choice that is right. And let us unite and do the thing right. Sunday, March 14th is National Heroes Day as we commemorate the ultimate sacrifice by the right excellent Joseph Chatier, Paramount Chief of the Garifuna, lone national hero of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Tune in from 8 a.m. for coverage of the replaying ceremony in his honor from the Obelisk, Dorchester Hill. Live coverage on radio and television, NBC Radio 107.5 and 90.7 FM, VC3 Cable Channel 114, also online at NBCSVG.com and the Facebook pages of NBC Radio, VC3 Television and the API. It's live coverage of the wreath lane ceremony from the Obelisk, Dorchester Hill, this Sunday, National Heroes Day from 8 a.m. This is a joint production of NBC Radio, VC3 Television and the Agency for Public Information, the API. This Monday, March 15th, the vaccination caravan rolls into the village of Sandy Bay at 8 a.m. And I am encouraging all eligible persons to come out to the London playing field and get vaccinated. Now, between you and me, I will be coming to Sandy Bay as well, and I will be taking the vaccine with you. But believe me, I am afraid of needles as a cat is afraid of water. So. I want lots of you to come out and let's do it together. If you want to congregate, vaccinate. We got this SVG. If you want to eliminate the spread of the virus in our place and do not procrastinate, but rather let us vaccinate. Hello and hi. Hello everyone. I am Shaquille Bob. I am a former Miss Pitani a former Miss Rural SDG and Miss LCD contestant and runner-up. I'm a lawyer by profession but a pageant lover at heart. Do not let the negatives prey on your mind because a stitch in time saves nine. So, it's COVID vaccination time. Get vaccinated today to reduce the impact of COVID-19 in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And I urge you, get vaccinated. It is safe and it is effective. Stop the spread, help the fight, and make the choice that is right, and let us unite and do the thing right. Sunday, March 14th is National Heroes Day as we commemorate the ultimate sacrifice by the right excellent Joseph Chatier, Paramount Chief of the Garifuna, 
lone national hero of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Tune in from 8 a.m. for coverage of the replaying ceremony in his honor from the Obelisk, Dorchester Hill. Live coverage on radio and television, NBC Radio 107.5 and 90.7 FM, VC3 Cable Channel 114, also online at NBCSVG.com and the Facebook pages of NBC Radio, VC3 Television and the API. It's live coverage of the wreath lane ceremony from the Obelisk, Dorchester Hill, this Sunday, National Heroes Day from 8 a.m. This is a joint production of NBC Radio, VC3 Television and the Agency for Public Information, the API. This Monday, March 15th, the vaccination caravan rolls into the village of Sandy Bay at 8 a.m. And I am encouraging all eligible persons to come out to the London playing field and get vaccinated. Now, between you and me, I will be coming to Sandy Bay as well, and I will be taking the vaccine with you. But believe me, I am afraid of needles as a cat is afraid of water. So, I want lots of you to come out and let's do it together. If you want to congregate, vaccinate. We got this SVG. If you want to eliminate the spread of the virus in our place and do not procrastinate, but rather let us vaccinate. on the various pages, on NBC Radio's page, VC3 Television, and also the Agency for Public Information. This, of course, is a joint production between the various entities. We now have the first part of our program, the National Anthem in English and Gary Funa. brings our faith will see Stray, a heaven come serene. What ere the future brings, our faith will see us through. May peace reign from shore to shore, and God bless and keep. Sister islands are those gems, the lovely Grenadines upon their seas and golden sands, the sunshine ever beams. What ere the future brings? Our faith will see us through. May peace reign from shore to shore. And God bless and keep us true.
Thank you very much, ladies. I'll now invite Bishop Gilbert Porter of the New Testament Church of God to lead us in the invocation. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we look to you for you are our helper. We thank you, Lord, that you have chosen this island nation. Lord, we are not saying that you did not choose others, but we are confident, oh God, that your hands are upon this nation. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us a spirit of excellence, that you have given us, oh God, a resilient commitment and focus, not just to affect our own lives, but to affect the lives of those in the world. And so we thank you, God, that your blessings will remain on Hiruna. Lord, we look to you from whence cometh our help. We are confident, O oh God, that we will make it and not just make it, but that, O oh God, we will grow from strength to strength, from victory to victory. Thank you for keeping us, Lord. And as so as we would take this day to celebrate our national hero, oh God, to you we give all glory and all thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Her Excellency Dame Susan Duggan. Governor General of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Dr. The Honorable Ralph E. Gonsalves, Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The Honorable Carlos James, Minister of Tourism, Civil Aviation, Sustainable Development and Culture. The Honorable Curtis King, Minister of Education and National Reconciliation. Members of the Diplomatic Corps, Mr. Colin John, Commissioner of Police, and other senior public officers, representatives of the Garifuna Heritage Foundation, uniform organizations and cultural organizations, the media, listeners and viewers and all the media platforms, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is a historic day in the life of Vincentians at home and abroad. I salute the people of this blessed land and the heroic makers of our proud history. Being here today is proof of our resilience. It speaks of our commitment to our heritage and buoyed by our struggles and achievement of the past, and yet we are hopeful for a brighter future. So I take this opportunity to welcome each and every one of you here this morning and those who are viewing and those who are listening and to wish each and every one a very happy 
Heroes Day 2021. We also would like to thank and recognize the two young ladies, Mrs. Andrea Games and Miss Ulrika Games, for doing so well with the renditions of the national anthems this morning. I would like to invite to the lectern to bring remarks this morning, Mr. Marlon Joseph. He's representing the Garifuna Heritage Foundation Incorporated, Mr. Joseph. Her Excellency, Dame Susan Duggan, Governor General, Dr. the Honorable Ralphie Gonzales, Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Honorable Carlos James, Minister of Tourism, Civil Aviation, Sustainable Development and Culture, Honorable Curtis King, Minister of Education, members of the Diplomatic Corps, Mr. Colin John, Commissioner of Police and other senior public officers, the Garfuna Heritage Foundation, uniformed organizations and cultural organizations, the media, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It gives me great pleasure to bring greetings to the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines on behalf of the Garifuna Heritage Foundation. Over the past two decades, there has been heightened interest in the Garifuna heritage and culture in the international context, in particular since the declaration by UNESCO on May 8, 2001 of the Garifuna heritage and culture as a masterpiece of the intangible heritage of humanity. This focus on the Garifuna culture internationally was buttressed by the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in 2007. This declaration signaled an increased recognition by the international community of the significant contributions made by indigenous people in general and by extension, Garifuna people to the development of nation states. The UNDRIP declaration presents a charter for future protection, preservation, and enforcement of the rights of indigenous peoples including, among other rights, the rights to their sacred places, education in their language, and information on their history and cultures. The Garifuna people are accepted as one of the hybrid cultures in the world, completely compatible within both the Afro-descendants movement and the indigenous peoples movement. As such, the Garifuna, a mixture of Amerindian and African, are able to transcend or fluidly intersect with two of the major streams of movements which are now in the process of challenging existing definitions of the power relations within post-colonial societies in North, Central and South America and the Caribbean. The unique mixture was forged on this island sometime between the 17th and 18th centuries a factor which changed the course of Vincentian history. Our 155 square mile mountainous multi-island was then a part of the spoils of war, bartered through various treaties and agreements between Britain and France, changing hands several times and even at one time declared neutral territory. It was the fierce resistance of the indigenous Garifuna and Kalinago hitherto known as Black Caribs, to colonial settlement and conquest, which resulted in the decision of the British to expel them in 1797. And it is this expulsion which, ironically, resulted in the survival of the main elements of the culture in the populations outside of St. Vincent today. This brief summary overlooks much of the known history of the indigenous populations in St. Vincent, as well as the long, arduous road to survival 
of the Garifuna communities after they landed in Honduras in 1797. Suffice it to say that what is significant for us at this point is that the declaration by UNESCO in 2001 is a tribute to this cultural survival. As a result of the exile and survival, St. Vincent and the Grenadines is considered by Garifuna in the diaspora as the ancestral homeland, Yerime. This year, 2021 marks 21 years since the declaration by UNESCO of the Garifuna heritage and culture as a masterpiece of the intangible heritage of humanity. Today, we are still seeking to understand the cost of survival and the quality of life of the survivors and the varying interpretations of survival. For the descendants of the Garifuna who landed in Central America, for example, the forced expulsion from St. Vincent and accompanying trauma resulted in the elevation of the ancestral homeland to a sacred place, the one common element which now links them all, regardless of where their journeys and the circumstances have led them. For some Vincentians, there is an ambivalence which stems from what one writer has termed the suppression of memory, caused by the colonial and the post-1797 experience and recreation of Vincentian history by the British apologists, another form of trauma. As a result, many Vincentians may not consider themselves within this framework of cultural survival at all seeing themselves as disconnected from the historical circumstances which led to expulsion. What is clear is that for Vincentians, this process of examination and analysis has begun, and we are of the firm belief that it will continue. Although the 224 years since the expulsion of our brothers and sisters to Central America has created a physical, cultural, social, and psychological gulf, Many Vincentians and persons from the diaspora are making a conscious decision to bridge that gap and meet each other midway. Significant numbers of Vincentians are now proudly acknowledging their indigenous ancestry. For Vincentians, therefore, the examination of the past may require an examination of the national conscience and the reliving of the cost and quality of the survival of the indigenous population who remained in St. Vincent post-1797. The ongoing project to write a history of St. Vincent and the Grenadines will do much to provide information, but to also provoke a national debate and provide the nation with an opportunity to examine, analyze, and confront its relationship with its indigenous people. We consider that our recently concluded 2021 first ever Virtual International Garifuna Conference has been a success in meeting its objectives. Certainly, from the perspective of the Garifuna Heritage Foundation, an organization managed and run solely by volunteers, the conference continues to be our most tremendous and ambitious undertaking to date. And we are pleased that we have strengthened existing relationships and forged new networks and broke new ground in many respects. The Yurima Declaration approved at the end of the 2012 conference still provides a solid platform for future action. The comments received from all participants and presenters to date have been very heartening and speaks to further possibilities for continued support and networking. We are particularly encouraged by the strong endorsement of and support for our work by the public sector and private sector. In closing, we must give thanks to the ancestors for the positive energy which our work continues to release in Yurime, for the massive amount of new information and ideas generated during the conference, and for the unstinting support of all who put the power of their financial, intellectual, cultural, social, and other resources at our disposal. Serime, serime, serime. We give thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Marlon Joseph. We do appreciate your remarks and the contribution of the Garifuna Heritage Foundation Incorporated. Just before we bring the next speaker, 
I would like to apologize for the absence of the Honorable Leader of the Opposition in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, who is unavoidably absent this morning. As we continue, I would like to welcome to the lectern at this time to do his maiden address at this ceremony, the Honorable Minister of Tourism, Civil Aviation, Sustainable Development and Culture, Carlos James. Please welcome him as he comes, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Her Excellency Dame Susan Duggan, Governor General, Dr. the Honorable Ralph E. Gonsalves, Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Honorable Curtis King, Minister of Education, members of the Diplomatic Corps, Mr. Colin John, Commissioner of Police, and other senior public officers, the Garifuna Heritage Foundation, uniform organizations and cultural organizations alike, the media, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we stand here in honor and recognition of the significant contribution of the right, excellent Paramount Chief Joseph Chatier. This occasion often entices us to engage in the poetics of nostalgia. Metaphorically, we stand here in the blood of the great Garifuna, the scent of sulfur and potassium nitrate pollutes the air. The cloud above darkens. There is stillness. Chatier in physical form is no more. But his spirit is sprinkled across the hills and valleys of his beloved Yurumi. place we now call St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We often leave these grounds with a sense of spirited, spirited nationalism and pride, grounded in Chate's heroism. I hope that the experience is not merely a novelty, just for today, that wears off with the setting of the evening sun. I reflect on the theme before us today, appreciating our identity, preserving our heritage with pride. It occurred to me that we can recount the French and American revolutions, but know so little about our, Gali our local Kalinago wars the vanguard of our faith and our fight for sovereignty. We have acquired an appreciation for Samuel Adams and Paul Revere and even Churchill, but seldom appreciate the role of Duvalet or Jean Baptiste, Chateau's brilliant generals. We glorify Rosa Parks, but are less flattered by Bota Mut, also known as Mother Selassie, a Vincentian working class champion of a woman and an epic symbol of protest against colonial rule. We can eloquently quote Shakespeare and Voltaire, but scarcely recite literature from the iconic Ellsworth Sheikin and Owen Campbell. And maybe we can name UNESCO's seven wonders of the world, but are hardly aware that the Garifuna culture, indigenous to St. Vincent and the Grenadines, was declared in 2001 as a masterpiece of the intangible heritage of humanity by the same UNESCO. In direct 
relation to today's celebration. We celebrate the Garifuna as our first national hero. Yet many of us are still not familiar with the language of the Garifuna. This morning we heard the national anthem being sung in Garifuna. And perhaps it should remain a staple as part of our national activities here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. These are unique paradoxes that we have to address in conversations surrounding the preservation of our heritage and our national identity. Our people endured the most gruesome crimes against humanity through slavery and native genocide. Our indigenous people were hunted and killed in cold blood. Those who survived were exiled, yet at the end of the transatlantic slave trade, the traders were heavily compensated. But what about the sons and daughters of the Garifuna and the Kalinago people? This is why our call for reparatory justice remains relevant to date. Three nights ago, I listened to a young lady, a Vincentian student of the University of the West Indies during the 8th International Garifuna Conference, which was hosted virtually this year. Her name, Relicia Andrews, as she presented a paper along with her professor on the topic Badiso, as sacred land sustaining memory and Garifuna ancestry through diasporic tourism. In her presentation, she was critical of our less than enthusiastic attitude towards local history and indigenous cultural sustainability. With passion, she asked, what happens when we forget the rhythm of our feet as we dance punta and paranda? What happens when we forget the heartbeats of our drums? What happens when we shout aye and no one returns the call. What happens when our culture is being dwindled before our very eyes? Are we willing to be innovative and take the steps to solidify our origins and longevity of our culture? We must respond to her challenge in the affirmative. We have to do a lot more to support the retrieval and propagation and preservation of our history and our culture. We must move more swiftly to streamline Garifuna material and other local history in our schools. And we must applaud the teachers and the Ministry of Education who have been finding creative ways to do that over the years. We have to continue our support for the Garifuna Heritage Foundation and their Garifuna Research Center. We must continue to connect with the Garifuna communities in the diaspora on projects such as Vinci Homecoming and other initiatives to facilitate cultural retrieval. This year, our government will commit significant resources towards the ongoing work to further develop the Chate National Park. Something I consider to be of historical value and importance to us as we remember the legacy of His Excellency Chief Paramount Joseph Chate. This year we commit over 100,000 to commission research and production of literature on the history of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The Ministry of Education will also continue to work closely with the Garifuna Heritage Foundation to establish the framework for the formal introduction of the teaching of the Garifuna language in schools. This effort continues 
And I'm certain all of us will accept that it is something that we must commit ourselves to. That our children and our grandchildren must remember the old zero me. Must remember not only Shatay as a national hero, but the history and the culture of our Garifuna people. We call on all our historians and creatives as custodians of our cultural heritage to broaden the scope of their creative space, to reach a much more social and technologically adaptive audience. This is the only way we will be able to connect our lost culture, heritage that is of historical value to a modern day Vincentian who is in tune with social media and technological gadgets. A few years ago, I had the opportunity of visiting Suriname with the Honorable Prime Minister on a state visit. I was amazed as I journeyed inland and found the richness of the Arawak community there, the Lukunu, and how they live and the legacies of their four parents lived through them culturally. The practice, the culture, and the tradition. Today I make this call to us all as Vincentians. Let us take some serious introspection about who we are as a people. Let us understand that March 14th is not just one day to commemorate a great national hero, but it is a step in going forward every single day of our lives to the realization that we as a people, our connection to the Garifuna, the, ind the indigenous people of Yurume, must remain in our hearts and our minds forever. So admittedly, I find it satisfying today that the only musical accompaniments that serenade our Garifuna champion are the drums of the ancestors played so eloquently by the resistance heartbeat drummers. The sound of those drums once drowned in oppression is resurrected here today and they echo more powerfully than any gun salute to our chief, our commander, the great Joseph Chate. I close here by stating it is my wish that our history and culture, so brutally and systematically suppressed, can be retrieved like these pulsating drums and be dispensed and consumed so sufficiently that we are nourished with a more profound sense of self as Vincentians, as Garifuna, as the people of Yerumi. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister James, for your address this morning. And how timely it is that we will have at this point a presentation by the resistant heartbeat drummers. They will be accompanying Shalana Maloney of the Renaissance Dance Company. And uh, we're happy to have them. And of course, they started us off here this morning. I recognize my former teacher, Mr. Victor Byron, Calypsonian Sule, and the youngster. Glad to have you here. Over to you guys. So in case you're just joining us, a reminder that there's live coverage of the wreath ceremony at the Obelisk 
at our Such a Hill here on NBC, VC3 Television, SVG Television, and also API's Facebook platform. All the other platforms join in NBC. Good morning to you as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The resistance drummers and Miss Fanoni, thank you so much. The pulsating rhythms of the heartbeat drummers, resistance heartbeat drummers. Uh, shortly we will be having uh, the featured dress this morning by Prime Minister Dr. the Honorable Ralph E. Gonzalez. Uh, just a note that's a relatively cool morning, a very windy one it is. Uh, lots of clouds around and uh, just a, a bit of sunshine in between, but very much a breezy one here at Dorset Hill this morning. Shortly, we'll be hearing from the Honourable Prime Minister and uh, we'll go into the citation and then the laying of the wreaths. We say welcome to Star Radio, who is joining us as well, and also Magic 103.7. Welcome on board our broadcast this morning as well. Stay with us. Your Excellency, the Governor General, Cabinet colleagues, the members of the Diplomatic Corps, representatives of various non governmental cultural organizations, including the Gaiafuna. Heritage Foundation, those who are here on the drums, our brothers and sisters, the Garifuna people, we are here in this ceremony, citizens of St. Vincent and the Grenadines at home and abroad. This year, 2021, the commemoration of National Heroes Day here at the Obelisk. It's clear from 
the two dozen or so persons that we have here and planned for it to be scaled down. Indicates that we are in a different time than we were last year or on any year hitherto since the declaration of the right excellent Joseph Chateauier, paramount chief of the Garifuna people, since he is declared a national hero in 2002. And this ceremony is held in the midst and against the backdrop of a debilitating a global health pandemic that connected to the coronavirus. And we are in the shadow of an effusive oozing eruption at La Sofre. If we put our minds back to 1795, on the day when Joseph Chateauier was ambushed and killed here at Dorsetcha Hill, it would have been in terms of nature, a more pristine version of what we see here today. Today, as then, the hills are and were joyful together. The magnificent undulating valleys present today or even more majestic then. And to the south of us, the, behind where I'm standing, the alluring seas of Urimi, of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Then, in greater innocence and a lack of the pollution that we have today. There was a war, a war between the colonial power Britain and the indigenous people the Garifuna and the Kalinago for control of our lands, for our patrimony, for our sovereignty and our independence. St. Vincent and the Grenadines then, Urimi, was not an island unto itself. There were forces gathering globally for change. In 1776, 19 years before the death of Chateauier, and a significant milestone in the 32 year old struggle for sovereignty and independence since the British by the Treaty of Paris assumed suzerainty of this country. In 1776, descendants of Europeans mainly British fought 
for the land which they went to in the United States of America, which didn't belong to them, belonged to the American Indians, but fought the colonial power Britain for their right to rule and establish what we now know as the United States of America. At this very, the moment of 1795, in France, that great nation was engulfed in a revolution. Indeed, so profound that in the late 19th century, a distinguished intellect, the late 20th century, sorry, a distinguished French intellectual was asked, could you please tell us what you see as the significance of the French Revolution? And he answered, it was too early to say definitively. And it may well be too early to say definitively about all the consequences to what happened here in 1795. But I don't want to say in a banal way like the medieval Pope Gregory in the opening lines of one of his magisterial works says things happen, some good, some bad. But many things have happened. And in, 18, in the late 19th century, late 18th century, into the early years of the 20, the, 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 the early years of the 19th century, in 1804, the successful, the only successful revolution by slaves took charge of a new country, Haiti, when under Toussaint Louverture defeated the French, the British, and the Spanish. That process, all of that was happening at the time when Chateauier was fighting the British and when he died here. We must remember and often we forget that in 1795, the majority of the people inside of this country, the majority were not the Garifuna and the Kalinago. The majority were enslaved Africans, enslaved African bodies. The first lot brought here in 1764, first th through, through Britain, of course, there were small numbers of African bodies which were, who were enslaved on the western side of the island, on small French, small land holdings by the French prior to Britain's suzerainty. The British came, they took the lands, and between 18, 1764, when they declared that all the lands belonged to the British crown, and the introduction, certainly between the period 1764 and 1807, at the time the slave trade ended, over 55,000 persons landed here 
as slaves. And the Garifun and Kalinago population was the historians would tell you in the region of 10,000 until they were decimated by native genocide. The critical period which caused the remaking of this country. But what I want to focus on today having accepted all in the, ex the excellent speeches of Marlon Joseph and Carlos James, two splendid speeches here delivered today, and I accept everything there and call what was said my own, and I do not intend to traverse the territory which they have already crossed to seek to add value. We have, throughout our history, faced challenges from nature, and specifically I'm talking about the volcano, and we have faced public health challenges. And I want us to talk historically about these broadly and how we have dealt with them. And we have dealt with them in a scientific manner, very sensibly, very maturely, very practically. We have dealt with them together in unison, guided by science, not propaganda, nor hysteria. In the 1850s, first of all, I would address the health issue and then that of the volcano. So we understand the sequence. In the 1850s, the historians here will tell you, those who are listening and our distinguished minister of education, Curtis King, is a historian. In the 1850s, after the abolition, the formal abolition of slavery in 1838, and after the subduing of the Kalinago and Garifuna nation by the British, and after the introduction into this country between 1845 and 1850, of indentured servants from Madeira. The public health situation in the country was terrible. And it gave rise to a national outbreak or two outbreaks of cholera and of yellow fever. We must remember that we did not have the yellow fever vaccine. We did not have any modern treatment for cholera. Indeed, in the 1790s, an, ama an amazing breakthrough was made by Sir Thomas Jenner with the smallpox vaccine. And for those who want to be anti-vax, I'm not going to talk about people saying, well, it took thousands of years, hundreds of years, sorry, for us to eradicate 
the smallpox or the smallpox vaccine. Very early, when they were anti-vaxxers against the smallpox vaccine. Because, you know, Jenna had to use the cowpox as the basis for the discovery of the vaccine for the smallpox. And distinguish enlightened persons like Thomas Jefferson, one of the founding fathers in the United States. He supported the vaccination program. But far more important than all that, Napoleon Bonaparte, who arose to leave France after the breakdown of the French Revolution. And as Napoleon was moving across Europe, conquering Europe, he remarked that his greatest ally was Thomas Jenner because he gave all his soldiers the smallpox vaccine. And you know, it's in its early days. You know, then you had some church leaders in some church magazines, even though Thomas Jenner was a devout Anglican. Thomas Jenner had to remark when he was getting opposition from elements of the church, the Anglican church. He said, well, if they don't, want to give me any credit if they want to demonize me why don't they simply say that we give the praise to almighty God for giving me a humble man the insight to create the vaccine you know in the publications they drew women with faces as though they have cows with horns. You know, when I took the vaccine, the Sputnik, somebody jokingly said to me, how oh, you ain't start sprouting horns yet? I told them they can look around to and they would see that no tail is coming out from me. Because all that is part of the crude, foolish propaganda. Because of the absence of proper treatment, including vaccines for cholera and yellow fever, there are wide cross sections of the population of St. Vincent and the Grenadines were wiped out. Study the demography of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and you'll see what I'm talking about in that period. Because I think the first census was taken in 1844. Full census. As Marlon Joseph says, you have to have memory, you know. And I'm not just talking memory today about the political struggles I'm talking about memory in relation to matters of health, which are fundamental to life, living, and production. You know, there was in this country a leper's asylum. I don't know if you know that. Below, below Fort, when you look down, you still see the remains 
I wonder if the young people know that. You don't have leprosy anymore now. You had in this country and in others serious outbreaks of polio which killed and which crippled people. Vaccination dealt with polio. Every year as children go to school you have to take your measles mums and rubella vaccines. When I was a boy going to Connery Primary School which school I went to as all boys did, all children did in the countryside went to school barefooted. I'm talking not too long ago, you know, I'm talking about the 1950s. Early 1950s because I was born in 1946. You know the problems which we had? Yours, Tobo, and Sugar. Because you had to go about the, the, the ground was full of a lot of germs and you're walking barefooted. There's a public health campaign in the schools led by Dr. Gideon Cordes. All the ones would remember Cordes. He founded a political party here in the early 1980s. He didn't get anywhere. He didn't call the St. Vincent Grandin's National Movement. Fantastic public health specialist. And general public health cleanliness and vaccines helped us. When I was a boy, in the village, in the schools, the governor general who is here, who is younger than I am, she's from, also from Connery. The numbers of us who went down with measles and mumps and smallpox because you didn't used to get it before you go to school. Children died from these infections. We are not going to get back to normalcy unless we have ourselves vaccinated. The science tells us so. And for those who say that there are risks, the risk of not taking it is I say to those, far outweigh the taking of the vaccine. And there are persons who are waiting for this or that vaccine. I said the best vaccine for you for COVID is the one that is available. And the vaccine for COVID is didn't start just last year for the development. There was an earlier SARS in 2007 and they started to work on it from then. It's the same family of, same family of viruses. And then there was MERS in 2012. The process accelerated admittedly. It is in the spirit of Chateauier. With good sense and solidarity and discipline. That I'm urging. And relying on science. That you take the vaccine. I'm not just telling you that I took it. And it's a personal decision. You can take it if you want. No. I'm going further than that. I took it, and I'm urging you to take it. And knowing what I know of Chateauier, 
he would have been an enlightened and scientific person today. Because for him to carry out the kinds of struggles that he carried out, he would have been an enlightened and scientific leader. I am sure that he would have been urging his people to take the vaccine. Vaccines are scarce the world over, except for the rich countries. And we have it here. And there are some persons don't want to take it. They're waiting. Waiting for what? In the long run, we are all dead. I'm told that one of the main reasons that we are not taking it, we do, there's not the urgency for us. Because we haven't been in lockdown. We haven't had the number of deaths. We have been able to hold things pretty much in good order so that there's not fear. Well, rational people do not act simply because of fear. You act because it is the proper thing to do. It is the right thing to do. There are cultural people who come to me and ask me, Comrade Ralph, are we going to have carnival? <laughs> I say, we will have carnival in July. If as we come up to the month of May that I see that we have reached a level where we can say that we have 70-80% of the above 18 population and then maybe it may go down to 16 Because the circumstances today are different to the circumstances last year. We didn't have the vaccine last year around Carnival. Our children and Chateau would have supported fully the education of our children. Our children are suffering because of not being able to go to school. And we are seeing a greater divide in the educational system between those where their families are encouraging them to be online and have all the facilities and those. Or not. And in the COVID period, the children of the poor and working people are disadvantaged and will become greater disadvantaged if you don't take the vaccine because it gets longer to get back to normalcy. And tourism is important to us. And you're not going to have the return to normal tourism unless we take the vaccine. Not just us, but other people in the Caribbean and across the world, especially from our source markets. Remember this. We all of us, we are all time. We can remember things, but if we don't use that memory to help us in the present and going forward, we are just locked in a time warp.
of all time. Only the future is ours to desecrate. Chate was killed in, 19, in 1795. You and I can't do anything about that. What we can do about is to learn from him. For our life, living, and production today. And for our future. Because of all time, only the future is ours to desecrate. The present is the past. And the past, there are many, many mischiefs. And I say this to everyone. I have been the leader of this country now for 20 years. And before that, I had a long apprenticeship period of study and political experience. Over 50 years. Are you going to listen to me? Or you're going to listen to some other persons. Why they're not brave enough to see what I'm saying. Bold enough to see what I'm saying. Or people who want to create little niches. niches. No. I want you to listen to what I'm saying to you. And I'm urging you strongly. To take the vaccine. A few years ago, when there was an outbreak of yellow fever in Jamaica, and I was going to Jamaica, I had to go and take a booster for my yellow fever vaccine that I had taken some time before when I was traveling going to Africa. They couldn't enter the country. I'm not saying they're going to do that with, with, with COVID. But some countries are talking about a COVID passport. And it may happen. We are following this very carefully because there usually you will find that happening through an international movement. They'll, the big countries would make their decisions nationally and then come to the International Civil Aviation Organization to have it formalized for everybody for air travel, for instance. And they will do it through the International Maritime Organization to regularize these things globally. That's what will happen, you know. We have fought COVID in this country without encroaching on people's liberties in any way which could undermine the Constitution. And we have used the law not as a sword, but as a shield and to build consensus. Build agreement. It's slow. But it is the best way because mark my words, this Pandemic is not the last one that we are going to have in the foreseeable future. As climate change accelerates, you are going to have more and more viruses coming to the fore. And as cities grow larger and public health conditions are not optimal, they are breeding ground for all kinds of viruses, humans to human, animals to human. So we have to begin to learn to live with these things in the modern period in the way in which there were other public health 
challenges historically as I've outlined. And we are fortunate now to be able to fight them with the ingenuity and solidarity of human beings. But what we are having is solidarity of scientists or a solidarity of science, but a lack of solidarity between peoples of the various nations, for instance, with the uneven access to the vaccines, and also within nations where we have significant confusion. We have to rise above all those things. We who in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we have to live with La Sofre. We have had, since the death of Chateauier, a massive eruption in 1812, which caused the death of thousands of persons. In 1902, nearly 2,000 persons died. The economy was dislocated. From 1812 until 2007, there was a widening gorge separating the top one third of this country with the rest of it. Until we build the bridge over Rabaka. Science allowed us to build a bridge over Rabaka. Of course, we got help from our friends in Taiwan, but unless you don't have the scientific approach to address it and the will to do it, it would not happen. In 1979, there was a cataclysmic eruption also. Thank God. Nobody died. And the way it happened may be part of the reason why. But the community was transformed. There are people who left over there by above the dry river. Didn't go back. People who left Chateaubelair and Fitzhughes didn't go back. That is why Rosu has so many persons from North. We know that North Central. And Redemption Sharps have so many people from North Leeward. And a mixture of persons up in Glen. You have to live with these things and accommodate yourself. And today, there's better science. Give us better warnings. And we are making better preparations. So we learn from our history. And we take account of what science is helping us to do. The persons who are down there at the evangelical church. Their pastors as pastors all over the world are addressing faith and reason. Christians and Muslims and Hindus, persons of all different religious faiths, Know that there is reason and that there is faith. But to have faith in Almighty God doesn't mean that you must abandon reason or science. Indeed, St. Paul addressed that question in his letters.
Paul, servant of the Lord, called to be an apostle. But I want to say this. I am disappointed that except for a sprinkling of church leaders, that they have not come out unequivocally to tell people, take the vaccine. I see Reverend Davis has done it. I see one or two others. And I don't mean to single out Reverend Davis. But there are too many. On Wednesday when the teachers returned to school to begin the preparation for all to work out the protocols for after Easter and for them to have an opportunity to, for the health services subcommittee of NEMO and the district clinics, the nurses to go from them. For instance, when Park Hill School opens on, Tuesday, on Wednesday, and South River School, and Connery and Byra, and George Tong, and I call those in my constituency. But the same thing all about. There's a clinic in each of those communities, and the nurses would be there. You take your vaccine, you, you have taken your vaccine before you take your card. And you yourself be an advocate to tell your other teachers who are reluctant, take the vaccine. And there'll be enough vaccines there for you to take. And then on Wednesday, when everybody returns to the public service, I want you to go around. I want when the, the nurses come around, the health services, personnel come around, take the vaccine too. I know some persons who are public servants, they're enjoying staying two and three days a week at home. Enjoying it, but it can't last forever. We have improved the situation. All of us together. And you have to go back to work. For some public servants, I understand a minority. Say they love it this way. They stay home 40% of the time, 60% of the week. And the end of the month, they get 100% of the money. Well, it can't continue like that all the time because the government may end up not with enough money to pay you. And then you will understand COVID inside of your pocket. At the time of COVID for the last year, the privileged people in this country have been those who are rich and those who have a permanent job like in the civil service, the statutory bodies, or those who have permanent jobs in the private sector. But a lot of people in the private sector have lost their jobs. And the government has been trying to support. But the support can't be as much as your salary. We have been holding it together. But to get back really to normalcy, you need to take this vaccine. And to listen in relation to the suffering, to the national authorities, and you be mobilized on the ground on both of these things. I read in the Gleaner this morning that the Anglican, the head of the Anglican Church in Jamaica, has come out very strongly to tell people to take the vaccine because he took it. Our religious leaders, I am asking all of them to step forward and be counted at this very moment. On Friday, I approved out of 
the vaccines that we have, though not enough for us, because St. Lucia didn't get as many, they ask if we can give them some. And I gave instructions to send 5,000 to them out of what we have. Because they are our brothers and our sisters. And I want to give to the international community the example, the shadow your example, that the noblest act of solidarity is not to give from the surplus that you may possess, but from the little that you have. Not to give from the surplus that you may possess. When I read about some countries saying, well, they're having enough vaccines for all their population. They're trying to get enough for everybody in their country. And then what is left over, they will give us. They'll give some to us. Well, my view of solidarity on this question is taken from the widow's might. And to extend it further, we are all on the dangerous road to Jericho. And I don't want us to be in a situation where the priest, the Levite, or the lawyer will pass you by. We have to bound up each other. We have to clean the wounds. And we have to take you metaphorically to the inn. Because we believe sincerely in the mantra. As was believed by Chateauier. No one is truly safe. Until every one of us is safe. Taking the vaccine. Is an important part in the current period. Of defending your country. Defending your patrimony. Defending your civilization. Promoting well-being and strengthening the road known ahead for our lives, our livelihoods, and for production. Thank you very much, and may Almighty God continue to bless all of us. Prime Minister Dr. The Honorable Ralph Gonzalez delivering the feature address here at uh, Dorsetshire Hill this morning. And uh, for those who are following us uh, online, very windy morning as you might imagine here, uh, we welcome you as we head into the final portion of this morning's proceedings, uh, which will be the official wreath laying by the various officials. So we'll get into that portion of the ceremony shortly. But before that, we'll also have a brief citation read by the Master of Ceremonies for this morning, Ms. Dion John, General Manager of the National Broadcasting Corporation. We reach out to you this morning, wherever you are, and ask that you stay with us. And of course, we welcome those who are viewing online on uh, the various pages. Today we gather to honor the right, excellent Paramount Chief Joseph Chatier. He died in this area, a fighter of self-determination and independence. This defender of Hyruna was ambushed and killed on March 14, 1795. Chatier led the Garifuna people in guerrilla camps against the invading French and British for several years in the latter part of the, 19th, of the 1700s. He won most of his battles as he was a brilliant military strategist. He was a world-class diplomat, and most importantly, he was, and still is today, loved and respected by his people. In commemoration of the life and struggles of this, the greatest son of our Vincentian soil, March 14th, is celebrated as National Heroes Day. In 2001, this day was declared by proclamation. An act of parliament followed, acting on the advice of Prime Minister Dr. the Honorable Ralph E. Gonsalves and in accordance with sections 11 and 12 of the Order of National Heroes Act, number seven of 2002, 
His Excellency Sir Charles Antrobus, former Governor General, conferred the order of national hero upon the right excellent Parliament Chief Joseph Chatier. So it was formalized from the 14th of March 2002 that he is our nation's first national hero. I invite you to stand with me as we observe a moment of silence after which we will proceed with the lane of the reed ceremony. Thank you very much. Please be seated. This morning, and in keeping with the tributes which we are here to, to do today, the National Heroes Day of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we would have the presentation of wreaths and the order will be as follows. The first wreath would be laid by Her Excellency Dame Susan Duggan, Governor General of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Your Excellency. And as we witness Her Excellency receive uh, the wreath from a member of the cadet force. She will now proceed to the base of the obelisk and choose her point of laying that wreath. Some beautiful wreaths here this morning, very colorful and a wide variety of different designs and uh, colors as well. Excellency gives us up at the monument and uh, Thank you very much. this is a wreath on Excellency. the eastern side of the, the second will be obelisk. made by Prime Minister Dr. The Honourable Ralph Egan Sals. The Prime Minister also receiving his wreath from a cadet and uh, proceeds to the base of the monument and uh, he chooses to lay his wreath on the northeastern portion much, of uh, the obelisk of course we're getting a bit more then sunshine now a wreath on behalf of the leader of the opposition wreath being uh, placed this morning on behalf of the leader of the opposition who was unable Thank to be here this morning much. for this ceremony. The Honourable Carlos James, Minister of Tourism, Civil Aviation, that wreath was placed Development and Paltier, will lay the next wreath. on the northern side uh, facing north for those who wish to know uh, the position in which they're placed. Honorable Thank Carlos you James uh, lays his wreath on the Minister northwestern of portion of the, the obelisk. The Honorable Curtis King moving forward to receive his wreath and as a gentle breeze blows across the Dorset Hill we feel the warmth of the sunshine now on our faces uh, first time for the morning we've had this much sunshine he chooses to place his wreath on the south western portion of the obelisk facing the Fort Charlotte direction to give you a sense of where uh, that reed was laid. His Excellency Calvin Ho 
the ambassador to the Republic of China, Taiwan. And uh, he chooses to lay his wreath on the southern portion of the base of the obelisk. Representative of uh, the Republic of Cuba receives his wreath from a cadet and uh, moves forward on the full sunshine now. Proceeds to lay his wreath on the southeastern quadrant of the Obelisk at Dorset Chile here this morning, where His we're Excellency coming to you live from. Manuel Santana Shaz, the affairs of the Embassy of the Court of Law Republic of Venezuela. Charge de Affairs, Francisco Manuel Perez Santana, representing the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, receives another beautiful wreath from a cadet. He too will gracefully enter the barricades of the obelisk and uh, lays his wreath on the southwestern portion Thank you very of much, the Excellency. obelisk. Mr. Steve Moore, resident, commissioner of the British High Commission, will lay the next wreath. Mr. Steve Moore, Resident Commissioner of the British High Commission, moves forward uh, and uh, enters the obelisk and places his wreath Thank you very as much. he looks up, pays respects, and uh, is placed on the western side of the base of the obelisk. Mr. Colin John, Commissioner of Police, moving forward marching forward as a matter of fact, quite smartly along with a cadet officer who does so in fine form as well. Salute and uh, commissioner gives a salute, enters the base and chooses to lay his wreath on the northern side much, of John. the base. Captain Cambridge, on behalf of the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Cadet Force. Captain Philip Cambridge, this morning doing double duty. He is uh, playing on behalf of the cadets. And uh, in addition to be the ADC to Her Excellency, the Governor General, receives his wreath from another member of his organization and gracefully moves forward in fine form as is customary with Captain Cambridge. And he chooses to lay his wreath on the Thank you very much, Captain southwestern Cambridge. portion on behalf of the St. Vincent Town the Grenadines Girl Guides of the Association. Base. A salute as he exits the barricade of the base of the obelisk and uh, the next presentation next wreath will be laid on behalf of the SVG Girl Guides Association by a member of the cadets thank you the Garifuna Heritage Foundation Now with the Garifuna Heritage Foundation, my representative uh, who earlier on did the national anthem of St. Vincent and the Grenadines in Garifuna, Ms. Ulrika Games. Excellency, 
and the General Employees Cooperative Credit Union, Gekko. The final read this morning being laid by Gekko. A cadet moves forward, pays respects and enters the inner area of the base. And chooses to lay this wreath at the Thank you very southern much. end that concludes of the base, this part of the concluding ceremony. the wreath laying a portion part of the ceremony, the ceremony this morning. We've come to the formal end of our ceremony here at the Obelisk at North Central Hill. I want to thank all those persons who were able to join us this morning Her Excellency Dame Susan Duggan. Prime Minister Dr. The Honorable Ralph E. Gonzalez, Ministers James and King, members of the Diplomatic Corps, representatives of various organizations, friends, ladies and gentlemen, those who have joined us via the media throughout the length and breadth of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, wherever we have been seen and heard this morning. Thank you so much for participating. Here's wishing all a wonderful rest of the day. Continue to stay safe and observe all the protocols. Have a great day, everyone. And uh, that concludes uh, our coverage here at the Obelisk at Dorsetcher Hill this morning. Live coverage of the wreath-laying ceremony for National Heroes Day. Today is National Heroes Day as Excellency departs with uh, Captain Cambridge ADC and uh, also the Commission and other specially invited guests. We hope that you were certainly uh, able to join us for entire proceedings this morning. Uh, there are many persons involved in making sure that uh, you saw and you heard what happened here this morning. First of all, let me thank our, our production team for making sure that uh, we were fully covered here this morning. On the technical side, the audio side, uh, Rainy King, our technician, double Nupper's driver. Additionally, you must thank uh, the friends at VC3 Television and Agency for Public Information, uh, those who provided the video support uh, online as well. We were live on the various platforms, NBC Radio and the Facebook pages of VC3 Television, the Agency for Public Information and VC3 Television. And also we were carried uh, simultaneously on uh, other stations, including Star Radio, Magic 1037, and we thank very much as well SVT Television for partnering and uh, bringing this live for those who are at home this morning. We hope that you stay safe, and as we lead out with some of the drumming from the resistant heartbeat drummers, we'll wish you a safe and a productive one today. Sunday, March 14th is National Heroes Day as we commemorate 